Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking today about an excavation we carried out in early 2016 in the St. Grange Branscore, right on the western fringes of a new forest. Um, it's really about examining changes between early and middle Bronze Age burial practice. Hopefully, we're going to debunk one or two more Bronze Age myths as we do so. Um, Sorry, I hope you can see that one. Um, this is basically a very high aerial shot of this part of the New Forest. You can just see um, the edges of the New Forest proper here in our typical heathland ecologies. This is the Avon Valley running down here. Our site at Branscore is literally between the two. It's very much uh, a boundary zone and a place between two very distinct uh, physiographic zones. And I'm sure that's very much part of its, uh, its significance in the earlier prehistoric period. It occupies the high gravel terraces overlooking the, um, the Avon Valley, looking westward, uh, an area of fairly fertile gravel and clay soils, not an area that would have been particularly attractive for settlement or agriculture throughout prehistory. And the New Forest, as we know, is celebrated for a number of discrete barrow cemeteries. This, in fact, is the uh, LIDAR plot of part of the barrow cemetery at Bewley Heath, which was excavated by Celia Pickett during the Second World War. Um, we know a lot about the barrow cemeteries, the barrows of the New Forest. We know very much less about patterns of settlement uh, within the forest at the time. And as we heard earlier on this morning, there is an assumption that much of the clearance of the forest took place during the Bronze Age period, but it's very difficult to relate this to uh, economic activity and patterns of settlement. There is a presumption that throughout much of this period, the New Forest was essentially a cultural landscape rather than a settlement landscape. That is to say, a, perhaps a place that at least in parts was set aside for the burying of the dead. All around our site, uh, on these high gravel terraces overlooking the River Avon, we've got evidence of um, previous prehistoric burial activity, particularly in the earlier Bronze Age. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see this very clearly, it's a little bit too dark, but take my word for it, we have a group of ring ditches in this field here, and just you might just be able to see at the back uh, a very elongated, ditched enclosure here, which looks suspiciously like uh, a cursus monument, and then down here, a double ditch feature which looks again rather like a Neolithic long barrow. This is our, our site uh, on the edge of Ranscore village, 10 hectares, the site of a former RAF radar station, RAF Sockley, uh, previously covered with a mass of uh, fairly standardised um, MOD and War Department <coughs> buildings, some of which have truncated the prehistoric archaeology. Um, within this site, we've got the, um, you just see the green triangles, the sites of formerly uh, recorded Bronze Age barrows, and another quite large group down here um, to the south. This is quite typical of the uh, distribution of barrow cemeteries along this part of the Avon Valley on the higher gravel terraces with barrow cemeteries separated by distances of approximately one kilometre. And a number of these barrows within our site were previously recorded by first uh, edition Portland Survey mapping. So this is our site here, you can just see the outline. This is in its former MOD uh, incarnation with groups of scattered concrete buildings and roadways. So, uh, we carried out an evaluation earlier on in 2015 and in early 2016, uh, carried out targeted investigation of none of the features that have been uh, identified by evaluation. We're going to be looking particularly up here at area A, which is really where most of the action is taking place. We're also looking uh, a little bit at area C and area H down here, which are also part of our story. 
And our story really begins in the early Bronze Age with the recording of the remains of four barrows. The first of these, Barrow 1.1, which we'll be talking about in much greater detail a little later, was very, very badly truncated, only part of the barrow ditch surviving, and only uh, limited parts of the original barrow mound makeup. Very close to this, Barrow 1.2, and was a rather very much smaller barrow with very irregular ditch, an annular ditch, uh, which enclosed three uh, pits containing either uh, cremation burials or pyrenated material. One of these uh, actually contained uh, an intact uh, accessory cup, a small grog tempered cup of a kind that's usually found accompanying uh, collared urns with an early Bronze Age. Uh, burials. We have a radiocarbon date for this, which places it round about 1700-1800 BC. And this is just a shot of Barrow 1.1 under excavation. You can just see in the side of the trench there, in, in section, uh, the remains of the badly truncated remains of the Barrow Mound. Um, and in, within it, one or two isolated in, um, at a very early stage of the excavation process, some of the pits that were later cut into it. We'll be talking about those very shortly. Um, this, in fact, is the pit. This is 1079, which was cut into Barrow um, 1.2, which contained our early uh, Bronze Age accessory cup with a cremation burial. And you can just see there. Um, the, the outline of a very sooty fill of the, of the actual cremation deposit. Moving down to the south of our site, this is in, in area E, um, we've got another small barrow, again a penannular uh, barrow ditch, which enclosed a group of pits, particularly including this rather larger rectilinear plan pit here, which was turned up in the evaluation, this is pit 1405. And pit 1405, uh, during the evaluation, actually produced uh, 74 fragments of a rather nice uh, cone-decorated beaker. And this has been classified as one of David Clark's classification as a late Southern British decorated beaker, which places it fairly late in the sequence of Beaker development, so a date not, certainly not earlier than 2000 BC, possibly extending to 18 or 1700 BC. So, a fairly late example. And this is uh, Barrow 1.2 under excavation. You can see some slots through the Barrow, the, the barrow ditch, and here is our central uh, pit 1405 under excavation. There are a number of other pits associated with the interior of this barrow. None of them produced any datable evidence. Um, 1405, given the size of it, it's about 1.5 metres square, looks to be fairly convincing in the remains of a possible beaker inhumation. There was absolutely no trace of an inhumation surviving here. Uh, local soil conditions are very porous, very acid, so the prognosis for bone survival is very, very low. Um, but also no grave goods either. And sadly, it's possible that some of these might have been removed by machining during the evaluation process. So the beaker is all we have. And this is just a close-up of our, our beaker pit. Just here, you can just see it outlined. With a group of surrounding pits, uh, which produced absolutely no dating material. It's possible they too represent incumations, but we have absolutely no evidence for these. Interestingly, Barrow 1.3 was surrounded by a timber circle. And we've got certain confirmed evidence of an outer circle comprising six or seven uh, large post pits around here, and possibly an inner circle as well, although uh, there's only three or four pits here, um, and this is perhaps less convincing. Uh, this is particularly interesting. There are quite a few examples. Uh, of uh, these around in the East Dorset, Cranbourne Chase area. It's very much like an example at Ogden Down in Dorset that was excavated by Martin Green in the 1990s. 
Interestingly, the fills of these post pits had been very badly disturbed, uh, indicating perhaps that the posts had been removed rather than rotted in situ. And a number of uh, commentators, people like Alex Gibson, uh, in talking about timber circles and the relationship to burials, perhaps think these are initial stages in the creation of barrow monuments. So we can perhaps think of the, the timber circles it surrounding our beaker burial at a very early stage, and then at some stage being removed, and the creation of a barrow ditch and a barrow mound over the barrels being made. And finally, um, in area F, we've got barrow 1.4, and including, uh, in, enclosing this particular pit here, which produced a cremation burial accompanied by a fragment of collared urn. Again, uh, Stuart Eagle <coughs> thinks perhaps a rather late example of the collared urn tradition, datable to about uh, 1800, 1700 BC, and again supported by uh, a radiocarbon date that very closely mirrors that. So we've got a reasonable dating framework for the earliest phase of funerary activity on our site, uh, which puts it you know, roughly between uh, 2000 and 1700 BC. Sorry, I'll get the in a moment. So we're going back up to area A, right up in the north of our site, and we're having a look again at Barrow 1.1, the one right up on the, the northern side. And Barrow 1.1 was actually um, pierced by a series of small pits containing either cremation burials or pyre deposits. In fact, there were over 40 of these, of which 31 contained either cremations or deposits of pyre material. And these were cut into the, the remnants of the Barrow Mound or actually into the underlying natural. Of these, 17 contained urns, remarkably well-preserved urns. Some of the urns contained cremated bone, some of them actually created, that contained higher material. There's an interesting distinction to be made at this stage between cremation burials proper and what seem to be just deposits of ash and charcoal. And in fact, on this site, um, of these particular uh, deposits, only 16 were cremation burials and 18 contained higher material. And this is quite a consistent ratio in um, Bronze Age burials of, of, of this period. We can't really understand um, the significance of pyre material, but it has been suggested that this actually simply represents uh, symbolic burials for people, perhaps, of this community who um, died in other communities and were buried elsewhere. And perhaps here we might think about the, our supposition for exogamy in Bronze Age communities, for people marrying out and joining community cells from there. Uh, and perhaps these are representative largely of female members of this community who've died in other communities. Interesting too um, is the fact that many of our bone deposits were very, very small. Now we commonly expect this in Bronze Age burials. What we have are basically token deposits of bone um, the average here was only 98 grams per burial, uh, but ranging from anywhere between 20 grams and about 350 grams. So it's quite clear that in the Bronze Age period, um, we had a very, uh, a sort of token approach to the deposit of cremated bone. We don't know what happens to the rest of it. Perhaps it's being disposed of in other places. Perhaps it's being dispersed amongst members of the cremated person's family. Uh, you know, here's a piece of Uncle Fred to take home with you. Um, we don't know, but these are only token burials. Of the urns that came from here, all belong to what we call the Deverell Rimbury tradition, which is a very important ceramic tradition, which really dates from about 1600 to 1000 throughout southern Britain. And we'll be looking at the urns in greater detail later. I think at this point it's really good to have a look at some of the radiocarbon dating results we've got from Edison Grange. We've got nine dates so far. 
Um, it's possible that our, our project budget might stretch to a few more. But these dates here on the left um, are those that have come from um, Barrow 1.2. This is a little deposit with that, um, that very early accessory cup. And then Barrow 1.3, um, representing earlier phase of funerary activity associated with barrow construction. And then over here on the right, this group of six radiocarbon ranges here all relate to cremated bone or charcoal from all of these secondary burials within barrow 1.1. And the important thing is here that we've got a gap of at least two centuries or so between the end of our first phase of funerary activity and the beginning of our second Middle Bronze Age phase. So it seems likely that what we have here is the reuse of the Barrow Cemetery by a later social group, perhaps a, a resettled farming group on this side of the Avon Valley, who have used one particular burial monument as the focus for the deposition of cremation burials. Why they should all have honed in on one particular barrow is a really interesting point. We do have some of these later burials at other parts of the Heatherston Range site, but overwhelmingly they are concentrated on one particular monument. And here I think we can begin to think about uh, the importance of things like ancestry, um, mythology or whatever in shaping people's burial practice. So the emergence of our urns, our 17 urns from the makeup of Barrow 1.1. Um, one of those important groups that we've got here is a group of globular urns, um, all of which seem to have originated from some way to the west. The thin section analysis that we've done from these suggests that the clay type is derived from the Barton clay of East Dorset, um, obviously around the Stour Valley. They're very, very finely flint tempered, um, almost, I suppose, approaching the definition of a kind of fineware, which is very different from the larger bucket and um, barrel elements that we, we find. So this is one of the first of these emerging uh, from the, its, its pit with the Barrow 1.1. Here's another one. This is a particularly finely decorated globular urn. You'll notice that it's inverted. And almost all our urn burials are inverted in this way. And if you actually, when we actually get to micro-excavate them um, in controlled conditions, we find that all of the, the ash and the cremation bone deposits have actually all fallen down into the bottom part of the pot around the, the shoulder and the neck of the pot. And the top part has, has, has gone. The assumption being, I suppose, that when they were buried, they were actually covered with either a fabric or a leather covering to prevent the contents escaping and then placed upside down. I think in the case of some of the larger urns, the intention was that perhaps part of the urn was left visible above ground, perhaps as some form of grave marker. But in almost every case, we've lost the, the base of the urn. It's either been damaged in situ in, in the soil or it's been truncated by later ploughing activity. But this is a particularly nicely decorated example. That's the drawing. And it's one of a group of urns from this site that have this rather nice curvilinear, shallow tooled ornament uh, around the neck and around the shoulder. And typologically, these are very, very close to a group of urns that have worked from Simon's Ground here in, in East Dorset, excavated by Chalkin in 1961. So much so that they may even be the work of the same potter. So we've got very, very clear cultural links with this part of the world across the Aden Valley, into the Star Valley, into Cranbourne Chase and, and beyond. Here's another uh, of our globular urns under excavation. It's rather dark, it doesn't look a lot of detail there. But this is what it actually looks like, uh, reconstructed and drawn, and you'll see the same kind of rather fine decoration. I'll whisk through these very, very quickly now because time is running out. Again, there's a further example. A large collection of bucket urns and barrel urns, uh, mostly flint tempered, again with tremendous um, 
but very strong cultural links to Cranbourne Chase, particularly Handley Barrow and South Lodge, excavated by Pitt Rivers. This is a South Lodge style urn. You notice this very, very bold um, cordon around here, ornamented with fingertip and, and thumbnail impressions. That's a, a drawing of it. <coughs> Interestingly, all of these urns were not made specifically for funerary purposes. Um, they are all, uh, all have their counterparts in domestic contexts. Some of them have wear patterns which are very um, consistent with domestic use. Some of them show evidence of repair. Some of them have evidence of organic residues, sooty residues, which show they all <coughs> for domestic purposes. Um, so they've simply been selected from the domestic repertoire and used for funerary purposes. But the selection of these urns is particularly interesting. Elaine Morris, who is looking at our <coughs> and assessing it is particularly interesting in teasing out uh, what she calls pottery families, uh, evidence of pottery twinning, possible associations of pottery typologies and styles with particular individuals. So you'll just see the range of some of these uh, urns that are coming up. Some of them are particularly large. The Heatherson Grange uh, assemblage is uh, remarkable for its large size. Some of these large urns have capacities of between 20 and 25 meters. They're 40 centimeters across at the rim. But associated with them, as I say, we have groups of uh, burials containing simply pyre residues and also other pits associated with this group that contain not cremation-related deposits, but uh, foreign soils, such as chalk and clay, from areas outside the new forest, which may well indicate, again, some form of commemorative burial or association with persons buried or moved elsewhere. And just to say a little bit about micro-excavation, which is fraught with difficulty. Many of these were fractured or broken uh, during 3,000 plus years from underground, but all were excavated under controlled conditions um, and environmental samples and bone samples extracted. Just to finish off, this is one of the most interesting of our burials. Um, the bone is extremely fragmented in all cases, so only occasionally is it possible to do, identify sex or age of individual. This is the cremation of a mature male. Um, and the only uh, sample that we have was actually accompanied by animal bone, in this case a very small sample of bird bone, which seems to be uh, included as a pyre offering. And this was also accompanied by a rather fine flint uh, knife that was made on a tertiary flint. One of the very few examples we have of an accompanying grave good. Uh, one or two of the other burials were associated with unburnt flint flakes, which were obviously carefully deposited items, but this is the only flint of any, any particular quality. Good, there I think we must leave it. Thank you very much.